We've had our message on Deuteronomy to help us think of how to preach from the book of Deuteronomy. And now we're going to be taught how to do that in our first plenary session. Please, Dr. Block, please come and minister to us. We don't actually need that. That's good. All right, we have begun the drink from the fire hose, preaching the gospel according to Moses. This is a very frustrating challenge for me. The, uh, the book that's coming out, uh, I'm finishing indexing while I'm here. It should be out in two or three weeks. The Triumph of Grace Studies in Deuteronomy and Deuteronomic Themes is dedicated to the Veritas class that I teach in Wheaton. Uh, we've been in the book of Deuteronomy for seven years. They, my wife keeps saying, Dan, you've got to speed up. And I mentioned that to the class one time, and they said, don't listen to your wife. <laughs> so after seven years, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 9, 8, and 9. So that's the Sunday. And every Sunday morning, we have a group up to 180 to 200 people gather to hear the gospel according to Moses. They've never heard anything like it because this is a closed book to the evangelical church of North America. It is. And so before we talk about preaching the book of Deuteronomy, we have to talk about what are we talking about? the book of Deuteronomy. So this morning session is going to have two parts, I, if I can stay on schedule, about 20 minutes on what is the book of Deuteronomy, and then the rest of the time will be on preaching salvation from Deuteronomy. And I think that's where we have to start. So in any case, Let's talk, whoops, I guess we need to get something up here. Will this do it? I can't believe it's working. Here we go. Preaching grace from the Old Testament, First Testament specifically, from the book of Deuteronomy. This first 20 minutes I'm calling the gospel according to Moses 100. This is the curriculum we're involved in today. We'll have 101, 102, and 103. These are the three courses. So to begin with, we have to remind ourselves that Deuteronomy is a very special book calling God's people to celebrate His grace and demonstrate covenant love for Him with action that glorifies His name. Right off the bat, you're going to say, I've never heard that before from Deuteronomy, really. There's only one disease worse than Leviticus, <laughs> and that's Deuteronomy. This is where a lot of people are. So, before we talk about uh, a particular text in Deuteronomy, let's talk about this book. And I'm going to do this, if you have it in your outline, under three or four headings. First, how does the Old First Testament talk about Deuteronomy? Well, we can, do, we can talk about this by looking at the designations for the book. Uh, what 
my specific charge here is to proclaim to you the gospel according to Moses, which is what Josiah's men discovered in the temple in 621 BC. This is what Ezra read to the small community of returned exiles in 444 BC. This is the document on which the psalmist invites his people to meditate day and night, to find in it delight and, and, and joy. Well, most people think that when the First Testament speaks of the Torah of Moses, the law of Moses, it refers to the Pentateuch. Actually, it doesn't. Ezra couldn't read the whole Pentateuch from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. What he was reading was the book of Deuteronomy. The scroll that Josiah's men found in the temple was the book of Deuteronomy. And so, uh, whenever you have references to this document, like the book of the Torah of Moses, or the book of Moses, or the Torah of Moses, or the book of the Torah of the Lord by the hand of Moses, or this book of the Torah, or the words of Yahweh by the hand of Moses, typically, we're talking about the book of Deuteronomy. We know this from the book itself because at the end of his addresses, chapter 30, uh, 31, verses 9 to 11, then Moses wrote down all of his, this whole Torah on a scroll. And it is then called the book of the Torah of Moses. It's actually not a book. That's an anachronism. They didn't have books in those days. The word safer doesn't mean book. It means written document, text. Through this process, chapter 31, verses nine, verse 9, the oral Torah that Moses proclaimed becomes a textual Torah. And there are a dozen references to that text in the book. How do we talk about Deuteronomy? Well, uh, I grew up in a Mennonite home, and in the morning, my father would always read from the big Lutheran, uh, Luther's translation of the German Bible. And in that one, and if, you, and if you actually live in a Germanic, come from a Germanic language, uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Germany, you'll find this book is called the Fifth Book of Moses. You have Erste Mose, Zweite Mose, Dritte, Vierte, Fünfte Mose. Fifth Moses. Actually, in my view, that's better than Deuteronomy. Well, what uh, in English we call a Deuteronomy, which consists of two parts, deutero plus nomos. Deutero means second, and nomos means law. Why would you call this book deutero nomos? Well, I can think of two reasons. First, Chapter 5, verses 6 to 22, where you've got the Decalogue. You call it the Ten Commandments. The Bible never calls it that, so I don't either. I want to be biblical. <laughs> it's always called the Ten Words. Ten proclamations, ten principles of covenant relationship. We call it the Ten Commandments. Yeah, there are commands here, but it doesn't start with command. It starts with gospel. That's the first word, a word of gospel. But anyhow, in Deuteronomy 5, 6 to 22, you have Moses reciting the Decalogue, which is the second recitation of the Decalogue. You have it in Exodus 20. The only problem with that interpretation is the Decalogue is never called the Torah. Deuteronomos, second law. Except Exodus 24, verse 12... Moses wrote down the Torah for their instruction. And there definitely doesn't mean law. It means instruction. We'll talk about this some more. So that's the first reason. But I think the reason is actually chapter 17, verse 18. In chapter 17, verse 18, Moses has what the Walt Kaiser calls the charter for kingship. Verse 18, when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself... And now the Septuagint reads, Deuteronomos, the second law. And the reason for that is the word for copy, Mishneh, 
is something like the Hebrew word for two, shana, shne. And so the Septuagint read two, the second, deuteronomos, and that's what gives the book its name. I think that's where it comes from. But I sometimes wonder what would have happened to the history of interpretation and theology if the Septuagint people had called the book what the book calls itself. And so we need to talk about how does Deuteronomy talk about itself? Do books talk? Doing things with words. I mean, there is, there is speech happening here. Well, in order to understand how Deuteronomy talks about itself, we need to look at the first five verses. And I invite you to turn there in your Bible, so I have it on the screen as well. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the desert, in the wilderness in the Arava, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Lavan, Chatzaroth, and Dizahav. It's 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them after he had defeated Sion, the king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edre beyond the Jordan in the land of Moses. Moab, Moses put into effect this Torah saying, oh, but now you're feeling a sermon coming on. <laughs> but what I want us to notice here is how the book talks about itself. And did you notice the expressions that are used for the book? These are the words. And that's what the Jews call this book, Ela Hadavarim. These are the words. Interestingly, it is not. This, these are the laws. Hebrew has words for laws. Three or four or five of them, this ain't it. No, these are the words. What is Moses doing in the book of Deuteronomy? He is not legislating. He is speaking. Second, that Moses spoke, Diber, it's not the word uh, even in command, it's not even. These are the commands Moses commanded. No, the word command is in here, as we see later, as the Lord commanded him. Moses is following the Lord's instructions, commands, but he is talking to the people. Third, and then in verse 5, this is the Torah. Across the Jordan in the land of Mo Mo Moses expounded this Torah. Now, the word Torah is translated law. But the verb here, he began to expound. That's my translation. It's related to the Akkadian word barum. That's what you came here. You paid your money for this morning. It actually doesn't mean to explain. It means to put into legal force. The whole book of Deuteronomy is what Kevin Van Hooser calls a speech act. And we need to ask, what is Deuteronomy doing? What is Moses doing with the words that he's speaking? Yes, he is expounding the commands, but that is not what the text means here. He is putting something into, a, in, putting something into, uh, he, he, into legal force through his proclamation. We know what that is in chapter 27. Stuck in here is this little announcement after you have the instructions of when you cross the Jordan, you're to set up pillars and write on those pillars this whole Torah. But then look at verse 9. Then Moses and the Levitical priests spoke to all Israel saying, Shh, O Israel. Today you have become the people of the Lord your God. That's what's happened. Through what's happening in Moses' proclamation or through Moses' proclamation on the plains of Moab, this generation becomes the people of God. This, you see, most of these people were born after Sinai. That generation had signed on at Sinai, Exodus 24. These weren't there. They've all died in the desert. 
rejected by God, and they obviously were not true Israel. They were physical Israel, but they're not spiritually Israel. But here, what's happening is through whatever Deuteronomy is doing, this generation becomes the people of God, and it is as the people of God they will cross the Jordan River and take the land. That's what's happening here. So, Moses put into effect something, and then the verb is, by saying. (laughs) And then he starts talking. The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb saying, you've stayed long enough. And actually, when you look at that first address that takes us from chapters 1 to chapter 4, there are no laws here. Unless the word law loses all meaning. (laughs) Deuteronomos. There's no law in chapters 1. What's missing in this first five verses is no legal vocabulary. Zero. What's present is the the Greek equivalence of Torah. Moses Moses, uh, put into force this whole Torah saying. What's this Torah? And actually, the Hebrew word means instruction. It doesn't mean law. It comes from a root, yara, which means to shoot an arrow, but then in a derived sense, it means to teach. You have this in Exodus chapter 24, verse 12. This is teaching at its best. And that's what's happening in the book of Deuteronomy. Have you ever noticed that the book of Deuteronomy gives only one title to Moses? Chapter 18. The Lord will raise up a legislator like me. No. Prophet like me. That's Moses. Moses is first in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is first. This is prophetic proclamation at its best. Changes everything when you look at it. The interesting thing is the way the word Torah is used in Deuteronomy, it can, uh, Torah means teaching that can consist of Song, chapter 32 is called Torah. It can be genealogies, personal anecdotes, memories, stories, whatever. Torah comes in many forms. It can be legislation, but it's not limited to that. It's a broad word, and so um, covered by the words in in Greek, didaskalia or didache. If you read the New Testament and you encounter the words didache, the range of meaning of the word Torah in Deuteronomy is exactly that. This is Moses' teaching. I wonder what would have happened to the history of interpretation if the Septuagint translators had called this book the didache. I think it would have changed a lot. Well, in any case, what are we reading? We are not reading legislation. Did you get that? This book does not set itself up as legislation. Deuteronomos. It sets itself up as proclamation. It's quite different. And that explains, in fact, if you read aloud the whole book of Deuteronomy, which we should have had you do before we started... When I teach actual courses, I require all my students in exegesis or whatever to read aloud the book that we're going to study for yourself. And if you've heard Deuteronomy read aloud for the first time, you would never call this the law book. You would never call it that. It's not your natural impulse, which raises the question, how did we get there? Now that we have declared that this is a book of proclamation, preaching at its finest, prophetic preaching, how may we hear the message? How shall we interpret the book? A couple of principles. One, hear the word. Uh, When all else fails, listen. When the psalmist talks, blessed is the the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the nor sits in the seat of scorners, but his delight is in the Torah of the Lord, and in the Torah he meditates, ruminates day and night. He is not talking about reading the Bible day and night. People didn't have their own Bibles. The Bible wasn't written to be read on paper. 
for ordinary people. Wow, we are blessed that we can have that. Nobody had copies of this text. But what are they ruminating on? They are ruminating on that which they are supposedly have learned from the Levitical priests whose job it is to teach Torah all over the country. Ruminate on it. Blessed is the one. But his delight is in the Torah of the Lord, and then it ruminates day and night. So they're, they're thinking about that which they have heard. Well, hear the word. This is now a, a chapter 31, verse 9. Moses wrote this Torah, gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. You shall read this Torah before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this Torah. That's the point. That's the point. But did you notice? Well, now, let's finish. And you shall read this Torah before all Israel and they're hearing it. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, and sojourner in your towns that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear. It's a bit redundant, isn't it, as long as you live in the land. But this is redundant because it reflects, recaptures the deuteronomic formula for life that you hear over and over again in the book. There are three elements or five elements to this formula. Read, that they may hear, that they may learn, that they may fear, that they may obey, listen actually, that they may live. I feel a sermon coming on. What's the point of the Torah? Life, not death. And to paraphrase what Paul is doing in Romans, how shall they live if they do not listen? How shall they listen if they do not fear? How shall they fear if they do not learn? How shall they learn if they do not hear? And how shall they hear if no one reads? This is why the Scriptures are important. These are chain reactions. The goal is life. And if you don't start here, you won't get there. Live. That you may live. And that's why we need, when we gather as God's people, we need to hear the Word of God. For in the Word of God there is life. And the book of Deuteronomy is exhibit A in that agenda. So, this is, this is the Word of God via Moses. Recognize the genre and form of Deuteronomy. Well, there are a couple of things we can talk about here. First, we now know, we've learned in the last 30, 40 years, that Deuteronomy follows the pattern of ancient treaties. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. I have on this chart, which you can see really clearly on my LED screen, different forms of treaties in the ancient world. Whoops, uh, I'm trying to point here, and it's not catching. On the right, Neo-Assyrian treaties, Safiri treaty, Aramaic, Exodus and Deuteronomy pattern, and later Hittite treaties. The amazing thing is, the book of Deuteronomy is cast with a mind to ancient Near Eastern treaty structures. We'll talk more about this later. But it is not the treaty document, and so it is a modified version. What we need to recognize is the book of Deuteronomy is cast in homiletical form. What we have here is a long Russian church service. Any of you been to Russia? (laughs) My roots are there, and I've been back there many times. I'm going back in December again. I love those people. When you go to a Russian, and not so much since the walls came down, they've been infected by American diseases of all sorts, one of which is trivializing worship and reducing the role of Scripture in worship, which is interesting. 
But when we first, the first time I went there in 1993, I'll never forget, Russian worship services typically had three sermons. I preached in these services, and when you're the last one, your challenge is to keep the people awake. They've already heard two. They want to go home. No, they don't actually. They're, at that point, they were so hungry. But that's what you have in this book. It is a collection of, well, it's actually the, 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 a transcript of a worship service where you've got the first sermon, 1, 6 to 440, the second sermon, 5, 1 to 11, 32. In my commentary, I still talk as if these two are one sermon. So there I have a three-sermon model. I've changed my mind. Is that okay? Uh, uh, everything we do is in soft lead pencil. And even when it's in print, it's soft lead pencil. So the new book that's coming out will have fixed this. I think 12.1 was originally a separate address. There are lots of reasons for that. So Sermon 1, Sermon 2, Sermon 3, and then 29 to 30 is Sermon 4. Then you have the closing hymn, the Song of Moses. It's called the Song of Moses. Was that so wrong? It's not about Moses. Moses didn't compose it. The Lord dictated it to Moses and Joshua in the tent of meeting. Whose song is it? It's the song of the Lord. It's Israel's national anthem, closing hymn, and then the benediction, the blessing of the tribes, and Moses is off the stage. Joshua, you take the next service. I'm done. What's happening in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is doing what our Savior did in the upper room discourse. He gathers his disciples for his last words. And he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. You believe in God, believe also. This is Jesus' closing farewell address, getting his disciples ready for his departure. That's exactly what most… This is what Paul does with the Ephesian elders. He knows this is the last time he's going to see them. What Moses is doing here, he is, he is giving his final charge to the people, and we need to hear it as his final charge. He's quite pessimistic about the future in chapter 31. Even the Lord says, Moses, you're about to die, so teach them this song. What's the connection? <laughs> as soon as you're gone, they're going to go off course. He will not keep them on target anymore. Here, Moses is pleading with the people, stay true to the Lord. Don't forget the gospel. Remember what the Lord has done for you and live in response to that memory. This is what he is doing here. It's a homiletical piece. So, recognize it. Third, read the book as an ancient Near Eastern document that addresses issues current 3,000 years ago. This was not written to modern uh, 21st century Cambridge, Ontario. So it never talks about computers, how we should deal with computers. Not to imagine that world. It has lots to say about how we treat our computers, but it doesn't actually talk about computers. It's an ancient book. Here, an example. When you build a house, make a parapet around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof. Well, what's that about? This is obviously not a command about modern architecture, how to build houses. I mean, where I live, houses have pitches like this because they get snow and they get rain and you can't imagine building a parapet. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about this. This is King and Steger's picture of an ancient domestic compound. If you've been to Greece or you've been to these countries, you know that the roof is, is the den, the man cave. <laughs> That's where you go at the end of the day to relax and to cool and entertain your neighbors and play shuffleboard, whatever. I, uh, I've been to the Greek Bible College uh, half a dozen times, and they, their dormitory looks like this. And up there, they hang out their laundry, whatever, and there's a shuffleboard. Why would you build a parapet around the house? 
Now, do Christians have to keep this command, which leads me to the next? Read it as a deposit of eternal truth. I want you to know that's my, this text is in my Bible. When you build a new house, make a parapet around the roof so you may bring. This is my scripture. Look, we Christians, we keep asking, do Christians have to keep this law? That is such a wrong question. Why wouldn't you? Oh, unless, of course, it's a, it's a law about architecture, but it's not a law about architecture. Get it! He even tells us that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your house if somebody falls from the roof. What's the point? Heads of households are responsible for the well-being of everybody who enters the house. Do Christians have to keep those? No, we don't have to. We want to. That's the wrong question, do we have to? This book is a deposit of eternal truth. Every command in Deuteronomy is my scripture. That's a, there are some challenging ones in there. There really, really, really are. I mean, if you've got a rebellious son, But that text is not about punishment. That text is about rebellion. That's how God feels about rebellion. The response to rebellion changes so long as Israel was a theocracy where the boundaries of the spiritual community and the boundaries of the political community are coterminous. God can mandate response. But that all changed when Israel lost its political identity. And they are under the command of... Have you ever wondered, why didn't the Jews just go and crucify Jesus themselves? Their laws tell them, anybody who's accused of blasphemy, you're just stone. And they accused them of blasphemy. Why didn't they do it? Because the sword had been put into the hands of the Romans. That's why. They were under somebody else's authority. So the point of chapter 21 is not about how to treat rebellious kids. It's about youthful rebellion. And it teaches us what God thinks about youthful rebellion. It is a fundamental error. It may be natural, but it is always wrong. And God feels strongly about that. This is my scripture. Five, reflect on Deuteronomy's significance in the light of Christ. Here we get into all kinds of trouble. You see, we've developed such cheap and trivial ways of doing this with uh, resorting to all kinds of typology and spiritualization, whatever else. None of that is necessary. I'll, I'll try and give a couple of illustrations uh, later this afternoon. When I read Deuteronomy and I hear about the Lord, Yahweh, I'm reading about Jesus. Did you know that? The New Testament makes two or three well, it makes lots of points about Jesus. But two or three fundamental points about Jesus. One is, he is the Messiah. There's only one conceivable text in Deuteronomy that speaks to that issue. And it's not, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me. I don't interpret that one messianically at all. And in the new book that's coming out, I have a whole essay on that. And I'm actually doing a, uh, presenting a paper at ETS in Providence in November on that. I have to go home and work on that. But in any case, it, in my view, that's not a messianic text. The closest you get in Deuteronomy is chapter 17. The Lord will give you a king. Messiah is always a royal idea. Jesus is the son of David. The king of Israel. That's messianic. The New Testament makes that point. The word Christ, Messiah, always has Davidic royal overtones. So that's one point. But the second point is Jesus is 
Yahweh. Paul writes in Romans, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And of course, the Lord is not a name. We've got a problem here. He's, he is reproducing the Greek of Joel, which has Kyrios. But what did Joel actually say? Whoever will call upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. Once a semester at, at Wheaton, we meet with a half a dozen Jewish rabbis. It's the highlight of the semester. Uh, a, a dozen or so of us faculty meet with the rabbis. We have lunch together. We talk texts together. And, and we've talked about this passage, whoever will call upon the name. And what offends our Jewish friends is that Paul is in this text applying it to Christ. That's the problem. That's blasphemy. Uh, we, we, uh, we read together with our Jewish friends the Sermon on the Mount one time. And we had, first of all, one of our guys gave a 10-minute evangelical Christian um, interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. And then one of our Jewish rabbi friends gave a Jewish interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll never forget this. I don't remember so much what he said in his exposition, but I do remember the nonverbal. After he was done, he stood back and leaned against the blackboard, whiteboard, and then he said, who does the person talking think he is? And then he stepped forward and he said, it's not Moses. If Jesus viewed himself as a second Moses, that would be quite tolerable. He thinks he's God. He speaks with the voice of Yahweh at Sinai. That's why we reject him. Or remember John the Baptist. They ask, Who's, who, who are you, John? He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh. Oh, really? But we have such a low Christology. Jesus is not the eschatological prophet. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the one whom the prophets announce. The Lord is here in the flesh. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. I was with the Southern Baptist for 10 years. I... <laughs> I've learned how they do that. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of chesed wa'emeth, grace and truth. That's the point. And when I see Yahweh speaking in the book of Deuteronomy, I hear my Savior. Same person. Same person. You don't have to go to all kinds of cheap typology to figure this one out. That's often low Christology. Read it in the light of Christ. Way forward. This is our way forward here. We've got three things on our agenda. Having set the, play, the table for what we're going to talk about, we're going to three topics. The grace of salvation, the grace of covenant, and the grace of revelation. It's all grace to me. People... <clears throat> People who are stuck in the old ways of reading, thinking, theologizing, get so tired of me talking about grace in the New Testament, or grace in the First Testament, grace in Deuteronomy. They think we have a monopoly on it in the New Testament. I've got news for you. This whole book is a book of grace. And you will see from those references where we're going to focus and this is chapter 4, 32 to 40, 9 to 31, 1 to 8. I'm actually going backwards in my presentation. I, 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 I've puzzled about Moses' rhetorical uh, decisions. Moses is, in this first address, Moses is telling Israel's story again, but he's telling it backwards. The reverse of the events. 
So he begins, chapters 1 to 3 is about God's grace to Israel since Sinai to the present moment. Then in chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, it is God's grace to Israel in the revelation of the Torah. Then chapters, uh, verses 9 to 31, God's grace to Israel in the form of the covenant. And then God's grace to Israel in the form of salvation, 32 to 40. Uh, he's telling the story backwards. Salvation happened first, then covenant, then revelation of the Torah, law, and then we've, we've left Sinai. Why does Moses do this? I have a theory, and that is, when he sends them home that evening, after this first address, he wants one song to be on their lips, and that is, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich. Or is it full? Depends on your tradition. <laughs> and free. That's what chapter 4, verses 32 to 40 are all about. Let's read this gospel according, gospel of salvation. The, the First Testament talks about salvation a lot. You have, uh, uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I do have it here. He talks about God saving, God redeeming, God bringing Israel up, God bringing Israel out. Then it talks about several specific commemorations of Israel's salvation. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and his household. And he brought us up from there that he might bring us in. And you go to chapter 26 where you've got the... Uh, Israel's ancient creed. Our father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt, a few in number, and he became a great people. And they treated us harshly. But guess what? The Lord rescued us. This is the big story that drives the whole book. This is the gospel according to Moses. And if you don't hear proclamations of salvation in the book, you're asleep. Or... 500 years of post-Lutheran dispensationalist and whatever other, my roots are in dispensationalism. I'm not anti. I've learned a lot from them. But I did learn that this dichotomy between old and new is not always helpful. And it blinds us to the reality. So let's go to chapter 4, 32. I, I, for the sake of time, I'm going to depart from my uh, notes. 4.32, I love this text. It doesn't sound much like law to me. Look how he begins. Look. Ask now concerning the former days which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything been done like this great thing, or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you've heard it and survived, or has a God tried to go and take for himself tried to go, dared to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials and signs and wonders and war, mighty hand and an outstretched arm and great terrors as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God. There is no other besides him. Out of the heavens he let you hear his voice to discipline you and on earth he let you see his great fire and you heard his words from the midst of the fire. Because he loves your ancestors, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he personally brought you out of Egypt by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in, to give you the land for an inheritance as it is today. Know therefore today, take it to your heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, on the earth below, there is no other. 
So you shall keep his statutes and commands which I give you today that it may go well with you and with your children after you that you may live long in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. That's a fabulous text on the manner of salvation. But as I was reading it, and I did it too fast. One should never read Scripture fast. You might have caught the outline. Here's his outline. Moses is a preacher. This is not legislation. This is preaching at its best. And you notice the history lesson, part one, verses 30 to 4. Theology lesson, part two, verse 35. History lesson, part two, 37 to 38. Theology lesson, part two. Oh, and then the practical lesson. This is preaching at its best. But of course, this sermon starts with story. And so I'm going to start with a history lesson. It starts with a challenge to do exhaustive Ph.D. level research. Look at verse 32. This is the scope of the inquiry. Ask concerning the former days which were before you, since God created man on the earth. Oh, unto the present. This is the chron chronological scope. Go and see if there's any parallel to what we've got here. Anywhere since history began, and then the geographic context, from one end of the heavens to the other. Well, this is not just look in Israel's libraries. It's look in all the libraries of the whole world. See if you can find anything like this. But then he sets the agenda with four questions. First, has anything like this Concerning the former days, has anything like this ever happened before? What he's doing here is saying, go check all the history books, all the records, all the annals, and see if anything like this has ever happened. Second, verse 33, has any people heard the uh, uh, voice of God and survived? And, and survived? Uh, has anything been done? No. Has anything been done like this, or has anything been heard like it? Now we're going beyond history. This is the second question. Now we're going into the world of legends and imagination and fairy tales. Have, has anybody ever imagined telling a story like this to the kids or at night or on the campfire? And of course, all of these are rhetorical questions. Uh, expecting the answer, a negative answer. Has anybody heard the voice of God speaking? Has any God tried to do anything like this ever happened before? And the answer is, nope. There are no precedents to this. This is an absolutely unique event. Never, never either happened, never been imagined. But what is it? Has any great event ever happened? Has anybody ever heard of it? Has anybody heard the voice of God speaking and lived to talk about it? Has anybody, has any God ever dared to do what Israel... The NIV at this point has something like, has any God ever tried to take for himself? That's so pathetic. <laughs> the word here is hanissa. It's the word for testing. That's why I prefer to translate dared, challenged other powers, other gods, other kings. Has any God ever dared to do for a people what Israel's God has done for them? What did he do? He walked into Egypt and he said to Pharaoh, I'd like to have my firstborn. And what does Pharaoh say? Sorry. Gods don't do that. You see, in the ancient world, gods were primarily real estate agents. Well, holders of real estate. They own land. They're not interested in people so long as the people in their land worship the god of the land. That's fine. But this is absolutely unique. There is no story like it in the ancient world where a god handpicks people for himself. And that's what he does with Israel. In fact, he invaded another town. He actually invaded Mesopotamia long ago, and he says to Abraham, you're mine. 
And then later, the people, his descendants were in Egypt. They're mine. God's relationship to Israel is primary. Never happens. Never happens. This is what, but how did he do it? Well, that is irrelevant to what. Uh, how did he, has any God dared to do it? And notice then seven words. Umberto Casuto, the famed Italian Jewish scholar, says, whenever you find things in sevens, your ears should perk up. And here we got seven things God did. Daring acts, miraculous signs, wonders, portents, uh, war, a strong hand, outstretched arm. This is interesting, outstretched arm. Have you ever noticed that in biblical texts where the expression, de where, where, where it's about Egypt, this arm shows up? Ezekiel has an oracle against the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, in which he says, I'm going to break your arm. And in that text, the words for arm and hand occur seven times. And I'm going to get, put my sword into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. But it's interesting that if you look at Egyptian iconography, not here so much. I mean, here he's riding a chariot. But look at this. There are hundreds of these pictures all over the place of the Egyptian pharaoh holding the, his captive with one hand, who's always a little guy, and his hand, in his hand he has the club. Here's another one. Here's another one. This is the Merneptha stealer. Here's Merneptah, his captives. Here's another one. All over the place. When the scriptures are being written, they know what they're talking about. So that whenever they talk about Egypt, what God does to Egypt, it's his outstretched hand or his outstretched arm and with his strong hand. It's very deliberate. God has a stronger arm than any Egyptian pharaoh. And then in the end with awesome deeds. So that at the end of the whole story, everybody's saying, wow! What a God. It is not, wow, what an Israel. It's not about Israel. And then you have the theology lesson. Uh, uh, there's more to the history. Why does God do this? Because he loved your fathers and he, he, he rescued their uh, offspring because of, of his great plan of rede redemption. But um, we get to the theology lesson. Twice he says, that you may know that I am Yahweh, God. There is no other. That was the point. God didn't rescue Israel from some puny little nation that held them captive. He handpicked the time of doing this when Egypt, number one in all the world, in its might and in its power, he says, I can deal with them. And he rescues Israel for that kind of context. This is the point. The point of the Exodus story is not Israel's Exodus. Did you hear that? God didn't choose Israel for Israel's sake. God, God didn't rescue Israel for is, Israel's sake. That you may know that I am Yahweh. Oh, I feel another side tangent coming on. Matthew 1.21 you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Really? Jesus, what's that? That's Greek for Joshua, which means Jesus is a second Joshua. Joshua is a type of Christ. Sorry, doesn't mean that at all. In the First Testament, persons' names rarely are commentary on the person. In Numbers 14, after listing all the, the scouts sent out representing of the tribes, and he talks about Joshua who represents Ephraim. And then, as a parenthetical comment, the narrator says, Oh, by the way, Joshua's name used to be Hosea. But the Lord, but Moses called him Yehoshea. 
Hoshea means he saves. Who's he? And of course, any ancient Near Easterner could have had a name like that, he saves. And what you put in there is the name of your God. After the Exodus, Moses says there's only one name goes in there. Yeho. Yahweh, whatever, however it was pronounced. Joshua's name is not about Joshua. Joshua was not a savior. The paradigmatic moment in Israel's history was their salvation from Egypt. Who got them out of Egypt? Where's Joshua in that story? Nowhere. He doesn't show up until chapter 16 or 17. Joshua's, Joshua was not a savior. If anything, the Canaanites needed salvation from Joshua. He's the aggressor. This is not about Joshua. It's about Yahweh. Moses says, I get the point. That you may know that I am Yahweh. You remember Rahab? The scouts come to her house, and what does Rahab say? We have learned that your God, Yahweh, is Lord of heaven and earth. She got the point. It's revelatory. This is a fabulous text. This is at the heart of Israel's gospel. Don't go straight to the law. Go straight to the gospel. Even the Decalogue starts out this way. Decalogue, you know it as Ten Commandments. How, do the, how does the Decalogue start? I love the woodworking the Amish folk do. Magnificent work. And the, we were at one of their stores in Ohio, and the, uh, they had a massive piece of wood like that with the uh, Ten Commandments in there. Guess where it starts? You shall have no other gods besides me. Really? You know, and then across the border, we have all kinds of debates whether we should have the Ten Commandments, that's their word, um, in our courthouses and in our schools. Well, the problem with the country south of here is not that they don't keep the Ten Commandments. They've never left Egypt. That's the problem. Gospel always precedes law. Always. I am the Lord your God who brought you, not who will bring you. God didn't come to the Israelites in Egypt and give them the Ten Commandments and says, all right, as soon as you can check this all off, I'll get you out of here. It's all past tense. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And now when you get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, you shall call his name Jesus. The Lord is Savior. That's what it means. Yahweh is Savior. Why? Because He will save His people from their sins. This is Exodus language. Only now, the enemy is not Pharaoh. The enemy is our bondage to sin. This is the gospel according to Moses. Let me conclude by paraphrasing Deuteronomy 4, 32 to 40 according to our own wonderful experience of the power and redemptive grace of God in Christ. So here's a Christian paraphrase. How is this my text? Christian scripture. Well, the Exodus becomes the paradigmatic event of divine salvation. And Exodus language is then found all over. But here is a paraphrase. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before you. Since the day that God created man on the earth, ask from one end of the heaven to the other whether such a great thing as this has ever happened or was ever heard of. Did any people ever encounter their gods directly as you have encountered him and still live? 
Or has any God ever dared to invade the kingdom of darkness and take a people for himself from the midst of that kingdom by trials and signs and wonders and war and a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and by great deeds of terror, all of which Jesus Christ, your God, has done for you on the cross before your very eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that Jesus Christ Yahweh is God. There is no other besides him. Out of heaven he came as the divine word that he might reveal the Father to you. And on earth he revealed his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And because he loved the ancestors and chose their spiritual offspring after them and brought you out of the kingdom of darkness by his great power, disarming the rulers and authorities and putting them to open shame by triumphing over them in him in order to grant us an inheritance since we have been predestined according to the purposes of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Know therefore today, lay it to your heart that Jesus Christ is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus Christ, Yahweh, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all the endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. It's one story, one gospel, God's gracious salvation. That's what we preach from Deuteronomy. I tried that this morning already. Sons you are to the Lord, chosen, redeemed, whatever. One more comment, and with this we close. Did you notice in these 32 to 40, with respect to this sermon, the proportion, how much time Moses devotes Two, the history lesson, the theology lesson, and then the practical lesson. Eighty percent of the words are devoted to the history lesson. Ten percent the theology lesson, and then ten percent the practical. You see how upside down evangelical preaching is in our day. Give me 10 steps to solve a problem. And we don't teach people to think godly. We teach them to act godly without any foundation. Historical, theological foundation. That's why we're in the mess. Which is why we need to keep telling the story. And it's not primarily our story. It's, well, my story individually. It's our story. So in our proclamation of the book of Deuteronomy, teach people the word of God that they might know the story of God. And the point of the word of God. And then we end with, so what? And all of a sudden we discover, given the great salvation, this call to obedience is not burdensome. It's a joy. It's a privilege. After all that the Lord has done for us, why wouldn't we serve him? And that's why he ends with, so keep the commands. It's not about law, it's about gospel. And that living in the light of God's revealed will is natural response, thank you for gospel. That's where we start. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from sin. That's the problem. The Lord is the solution. Thanks be to God.
Well, would you join me in thanking Dr. Block for uh, that? That was <laughs> phenomenal. You know, uh, we, we envision these days, these preaching lectures, as a day when you learn a little bit more about preaching. But isn't it true that when you come to a day like this, you also need your soul filled? And today, I hope as a person, as a pastor, as a follower of Christ, today you've already just had the gospel fill you up, and there'll be more after lunch. So, Dr. Block, thank you so much. You served us very, very well. Good thing you're young, too, by the way, because you got a lot of energy going up here. So... Uh, <laughs> That was great. Uh, a lot of you are uh, not only students, but a lot of you are pastoral and ministry leaders are friends of Heritage. So as, before we release you to lunch, I just want to give you an update. My name is Rick Reed. I serve as the president here at the school and also one of the professors. I want to give you an update because you have a stake in what we're doing, just like we have a stake really in what you are doing for the Lord. So I want to give you a bit of an update on the school, starting with uh, some reasons we have to praise the Lord. There uh, may be some slides behind me, but I'll go through these rather quickly. We are celebrating, to use Dr. Block's word, the goodness of God, feasting on his goodness as we start this new term. There's a number of things I could highlight, but let me just give you a few. First of all, uh, we've had some campus upgrades. Uh, if you're newer to coming to Heritage, please take some time over lunch and just walk around. If you've never seen the kind of upgraded student center that's been a joy for our students, you'll want to see that. We've added some things to that. This summer, there is a recording arts studio actually just up the top that it's going to be a great joy for our music students. It's really a suite of recording art um, areas. So that's going on in the other building by the library. We've added what's called the Heritage Learning Center, Student Learning Center. And tutoring goes on there. It's a way of just uh, Greek tutoring, uh, Hebrew tutoring, uh, essay writing. So that goes on uh, throughout the week. We've, we found that to be already a bonus for our students. The chapel where we sometimes meet has been upgraded with some lighting and new staging. So you might want to look around. There's one thing you don't care about until it rains is there's a new roof on this place, and we appreciate those who help that get up as well. So we're thankful to the Lord for the facilities that he's given us. Second thing, though, is the enrollment, because the, the facilities only matter when God sends us students. And this year we have a bumper crop of some really stellar students coming in, new students. The college is up about 20%. Over uh, last year, one of our larger enrollments in, uh, in a number of years, and we're delighted that dorms are full and the students seem very keen. We had a lot of the first year students got to sit in on the first session today because we wanted them just to get a little exposure to uh, kind of this kind of a venue. Seminary as well. Uh, historically, our, our high point up to this point, our high watermark had been about 700 credit hours for a semester. And God really just kind of uh, shocked us and blew that away. And I think it's somewhere in the 850s. So it was a massive jump. And again, I would say not just more bodies, but really some solid men who want to be pastors, men and women who are, want to serve the Lord in a variety of ways. And we're rejoicing in the, the ones God has brought to us. Third area that are rejoicing is the debt demolition. Some of you have joined with us. We've been praying for several years and pecking away and chipping away at this debt. It was over $3 million. And uh, when we came to this July 1st, it was $2.7 million. Our mortgage came due on October 1st. So from July 1st to October 1st, $2 million uh, was given to the school through a variety of people. And uh, like that was just uh, exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. So the, our debt load now is under $700,000, which as you know, any of you uh, just work in an institution, that's a huge blessing for the ministry of the school because instead of putting money to the bankers, we can put it into the ministry. So uh, we are just rejoicing in God's kindness to us as a school. And our, there's a lot of smiles uh, on our faces right now over his goodness. So I give you those as reasons to rejoice. Let me give you a one prayer request. There could be many, but I'm going to ask you to pray with us. Next Monday evening, we have a team of men and women from across North America who are part of the ATS 
That's the Association of Theological Schools. Part of their doing accreditation site visit. That's a big thing for institutions. And we have been on associate status for a time. And over the last few years, under really the leadership of Dr. Barker and our team, we pulled together, done a big self, massive self-study report. And now this is kind of the fruit of it. The accreditation team comes and they spend about a week with us. They'll meet with all our stakeholders, our key people. And uh, that happens Monday to Thursday. We're uh, applying, obviously, for full um, status, accreditation status with them. And we're also, as part of that, applying to be able to do an MTS fully online, so full distance, which uh, will help. You know, Canada's a big place and people are spread out. So this would allow somebody who can't easily get here to do more of their coursework or actually all of their coursework in an MTS at a distance level. We've installed some kind of high quality uh, video and audio recording in a couple of classrooms, so we'll be live streaming some courses. So we're quite excited about the opportunities that will open up. But would you pray with us that next Monday to Thursday is a joy? Uh, we're just, we're trusting, we're going to be transparent. We're not a perfect school. We're one trying to grow and we want to be uh, just who we are, but we think that uh, what we've heard so far is very positive from them. And that's coming up. And then uh, an invite. Let me just give you a next one. Uh, this is a preaching day, so I want to highlight one preaching thing. Um, my line is this. I often say this. Pastors have to do more than preach well, but they can't do less than preach well. I mean, that, that's just part of how we feed people the Word of God. And we have a... a we care about the, the young ones and the ones who are training for ministry. We teach them homiletics. But we also care about those who are practitioners, preachers and teachers, like many of you are, who are doing this week in and week out. We have a training module for you that we call the Graduate Certificate in Biblical Preaching. And it's five courses, and we're starting up a brand new cohort in about a week and a half. And it's not too late. We still have a few spots. If we keep those things kind of small, it's very personal. We bring in some really top flight preaching instructors from around North America, and you get to be part of that. Uh, it's, it's a very, very engaging. The guys that have done it have all told me it's helped their preaching go up. So if you'd like to know more about that, you can stop by and talk to the booth uh, where Jeff Swan is. Talk to me. I actually teach the first course that's happening here in a couple weeks. And we deal with five areas, and they will help your preaching go from where it is, wherever that is, to get better. And that's really our hope, is that all of us keep growing. Like Paul told Timothy, let your progress be seen to all. So, and here's one little twist. We're just starting this. We did it with Brian Chappell's class last time. If you have a master's degree already in theology or divinity, and if you say, I, I don't need the credits because these courses can be used for a degree. But you're saying, I don't need the credits, but I do want to keep growing. You can come and take the course, the two days, sit in on it for, I think it's 200 bucks. So it's like uh, just a refresher, a challenge. And you can take this and, uh, as a way of keeping sharp in your own preaching. So if you'd like to know more about that, kind of get in quick, because we're almost there. You can talk to us today or give us a shout on that. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with this and invite Keith Edwards. Keith, why don't you come up with me? We have one last thing that we're launching kind of uh, today. It's kind of the soft launch of it, but it applies to all of you who uh, are laboring for the Lord in churches. You need to know that we love the church. We as a school exist for the church. Uh, we believe the church is at the epicenter of the mission of God in the world. And we believe that the school does its role when it strengthens those of you who are out serving the Lord in local churches. And we specifically have a heart for those, we all, all churches, but there are some churches that have chosen to become partners with us. They're called partner churches. It's open to any. But when a church kind of links with us as a partner church, we're trying to say, how can we add more value to you as pastoral team and also to your church? And so we are launching something we're quite excited about. We have some funding that's come through a foundation that cares about church revitalization, church health, and they're able to help us, and we're passing that blessing on to you through what we're calling the Heritage Partner Church Resource Center. And Keith Edwards is the director of that ministry, and I've invited him just to give you a little of a preview of it. Today at lunch, if you're a partner church, you're invited for a lunch upstairs. We'll fill it out a little bit more. But Keith, tell us a bit. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed. We are blessed to have had a number of conversations with our partner churches. Most of those are located in Ontario. We do have some outside of the province, and we're asking God to raise up that number. If you're interested in becoming a partner church, you can go to discoverheritage.ca uh, forward slash partner. Uh, we're going to launch it today, and you'll see on the, on the web, if you follow us through uh, our uh, social media, there'll be a new Twitter account, new Facebook page, and we're hoping to launch a new website in 2018 where we can fil facilitate the sharing of resources. In conversation with some of the partner churches, we realize there's just a wealth of experience, uh, training, tools, uh, helpful resources that we want churches to be able to share uh, with each other. And uh, what we're going to do through, if we can have the next slide, what we're going to do is take the five courses that were designed as part of the Graduate Certificate in Church Health and Evangelism and uh, boil them down into one. I'm not a master chef, but I'm hoping to uh, get the, the professors together and we'll, we'll uh, together uh, design this one course in revitalization. It'll be available for current students as well as those who are, are interested in seeing greater internal uh, health and greater external impact in terms of gospel uh, impact. And then as we gather from resources, uh, resources from the churches, we want to share those biblical, theological, practical uh, online resources, those will be available. And then one-day conferences. Our first one will be January 19th. And again, that will be an introduction. That will be sort of a condensed, this is not an academic process, but it will be a way to introduce topics that we feel are essential and vital in terms of uh, moving forward in this area. And then as part of coaching and consulting, coming alongside churches, there are a network of leaders across this province and in partnership with various uh, denominations, we would like to make some of that expertise, particularly pastoral leadership expertise, available as, as pastors and some of you who are here to avail yourself and make yourself available to help in this uh, process. And then lastly is the whole area of uh, college and seminary uh, internships. Uh, if we could have the last slide. How many of you have either been in an internship or are in a pastoral or ministry internship? If I could see your hands. It's, it's significant, and we believe, and certainly in the, in the Master of Divinity program, this is an essential part of, of training, and both on the college and on the seminary side. I frame the conversation as part of the process around these four areas, and I invite your further input. First of all, around the area of conversion. And then secondly, calling, how do you discover where God has called you? Thirdly, the whole area of character, which is either the qualifier or the disqualifier in terms of ministry, and then lastly, the whole area of competencies. So we're looking forward to partnering together, hearing from you, having you network with others, and we look forward to having many conversations. You'll be getting email updates, those of you who are partner churches already, phone calls, in-person visits from myself as I network with you. Thanks. I'm going to invite Dr. Housen up to give us some lunch instructions, but if you are not yet a partner church but like to have some more information on how you can be, uh, back at the table where Jeff Swan is, the seminary table, take one of uh, the little flyers on it. Uh, one of the best benefits for you, for partner churches, is we give a 25% seminary bursary to your staff and uh, spouses of staff for seminary courses. So we try to make it just as affordable as we can. So if you're not yet, we're, we have, I think, about 86 or 7 partner churches, and we'd love to see that grow and we'd love to be able to service you in that way. So, Dr. Housen, please come. So the partner churches are going to be meeting anyone who would like to join with uh, Dr. Reed, and that will be in room 201, and lunch will be provided for you there. 201, and anyone who is interested even in partner churches may go to that as well. Again, just a reminder, the back of your bulletin tells you the various locations you can go to to eat. Since we're very much on time, Dr. Block, this is amazing. Um, we're only five minutes past what we want it to be. So that means at 20 after, okay, 20 after one, we need to be back here, okay? 20 after one, back here. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>